when I left school, I went to work with my father. I was very fortunate uh, as a French polisher. Mm -hmm. A lot of the lads who were far, far brighter than me had no, no option but to work in the mill. But as I say, I was lucky I went to work for my father. And uh, he taught me a trade. And when I was 16, after initiation into the job, I wasn't, of course, fully qualified because it was a seven years apprenticeship, you see, then, not six months like now. And uh, when I was 16, he says, right, lad, he says, get your, get your best suit on, clean your shoes, get yourself down to Leeds and get yourself a job. And he says, make, you look, make yourself look smart. He said, because if you go to a tramp, I said, they'll give you a job to match. So I did, and I got a job at the place Moslins on East Street, uh, polishing wireless cabinets. Uh, it was a bit undaunting to me. For a 16-year-old in those days, you didn't really go out of the village much, you see. And uh, when, uh, when you had to go down to Leeds, it was a bit of an adventure. I mean, it's nothing today, but it was then. And uh, I always remember I was, of course, the youngest there, so I was what they call the tea boy. Now, <laughs> I had to, had to see to all the, the people making, mashing teas and that. And they, well, we used to have a, a piece of paper and they used to come with the tea leaves, Nestle's milk and sugar all wrapped in this <laughs> and I had to scrape it off. <laughs> Uh, I was told to go to this lady's house up Cavalier Street. Now, this lady was a bit like Hilda Ogden on television, with a squeaky voice. And, of course, I was nervous, obviously, on the first day, and I had, I had about 20 uh, polishers' cups and that to, to mash tea in. And she said, come in. So I went in, and I looked in the house. I'd never seen all like it, you see. I wasn't used to this. And uh, when I went in, there was a gas ring with a rubber pipe attached to it. It was dangerous, but now she's boiling a kettle and she charged a halfpenny to, to mash the teas. And it was, I looked at the house and there was no banisters. The handrail and the newel post, but no banisters. And there were no panels in the door. And I realised, of course, then, they were using that for firewood. And this, of course, was an experience. And this is what my father wanted. He wanted me to go and get experience of the outside, not be cushioned by him all the time. As he said, I, know, I don't know everything about French polishing. You never know. He said, keep your mouth shut and keep your eyes open. So that was the first experience. It was. It gave me a good start in life. Yeah. It made me realise that I had to stick up for myself a little bit. It was. Uh, uh, it was help help at all. It was help. Um, but uh, when the war broke out, uh, I was working for the government. Actually, I wasn't working with my father, because in those days there were no set job. You know, it wasn't a job for life. You might be working for the firm for three months and then they finish and go work somewhere else. We were called journeymen, you see. And I worked for the government at one period, polishing, when they were, you know, the recruiting uh, people. I, when they came to me, I was working at uh, an RAF place in Leeds, and they came to me on the Friday, and they said, well, I'm sorry, lad, they said, you'll have to finish. I said, why, they're not wrong with my job. No, he says, it's not to do with that, he says, Every, all the polishers have finished, he says, and the joiners are on blackouts, making, w w uh, covering the windows up, you know, for the war. Mm -hmm. Of course, the war broke out on the 3rd, you see, didn't it? September. And uh, that was that. I was out of work. No, I went, when it was Sunday, I was courting at that time, and I was at my late young lady's house, and I remember... It was Sunday, and Ch um, Chamberlain came on and said, we are now at war with Germany. And that was the first uh, initial thing I had about the war. But uh, I've, I've uh, 
I've uh, been very lucky. I had a very good tutor with my my father. He taught me not just my trade, but taught me a lot of other things besides about looking after myself and sticking up for myself. And it's uh, it's uh, seeming good stead. When I went to sign on, uh, I got this letter to say I had to report to this particular place. Market, Mar- Boys Market Club, I think, somewhere down in Leeds. And uh, they said, what did you... There's a chap, of course I didn't know it about army, you see. This fellow said, now then, what did you do? I said, well, a French polisher. Oh, he says, I put you in the um, engineers, you know, being a tradesman. So when I got my papers, I was in infantry. <laughs> and uh, that's how it started. Well, of course, I got called up. As normal. Well, actually, I got married. I got married uh, Easter Saturday and about, well, it'll be probably about six weeks or so after uh, I got to me calling up papers, you see. I haven't been married very long. So off I went. When I first got called up, I went from Leach City Station to Weatherby, the Weatherby Race Course, and uh, got to Weatherby Race Course and uh, we marched up like, and uh, he said, oh, I said, uh, uh, get in our beds, you see. We were all in civilian clothes, of course. And we got two blankets, and that was a bed. Well, it was a bit of a shock after leaving, <laughs> having a proper bed on the floor. We were in the race course at Weatherby inside, and that's where I first experienced army life. We got... Uh, there were no pillar or anything, you know. You just folded anything up and put down two blankets. That was that was the that was it. I remember there was a sergeant. He was a, an old soldier, regular. And when we got our first uniform, he says, "Now then, lads," he says, uh, "You want to look smart?" He says, I'll, "I'll get an iron for you, and you'll be able to iron your trousers, you know, and put a crease and make it just right." So we all gave him sixpence. And we're still waiting for the iron. It was an old soldier, you see. Well, we, you learn quick. That we'll never do that again. And there were other things that happened. I mean, lots of things that happened over the six years. I mean, incidents that were laughable and some weren't, you know. But, uh, I mean, I could go on for hours. But <laughs> Straight away, that the sergeant says, if you do as you're told, you know, in, in, do as you're told, you're in, not in trouble. But if you start kicking the traces, you're in, you're in for it, you know, and you were. What used to happen to you if you got caught doing something? Well, they give you what we call jankers. You would get go to cookhouse. No time off. You were straight up to cookhouse, peeling potatoes and doing as you were told, <laughs> washing out monkey dishes and cleaning them. And <laughs> there was lots of incidents, of course, <clears throat> but the most vivid incident was when both my mates got killed. I was in a brain gun car, in reconnaissance, and we were we were we used sleep slept at the back of the line, but very early in the morning we'd get up and whatever job that was asked to do we had to go and reconnoitre. We weren't a fighting unit. We, we, we all had was a brain a, a machine a, a brain gun, you know, but we had to spy out, as you might say, where the Germans were and gave information. Whatever we could, whether we're at a bridge that had been blown or not, or wh- how many people you could see. And uh, anyway, uh, that was the job we had. When we got this order, we... I don't know exactly whether it was France or Germany, because um, uh, as at that time, you didn't... No, the, the 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 same as in France. They were all French names. They didn't go. It didn't register. But we went by um, longitude nothing. What they call it? Oh, oh dear. My brain's gone. Uh, wait, wait, well, when you're giving you your position, you don't bo- go by towns. Like coordinates. Yeah, no, but it long longitude and latitude. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's, uh, that's where we, you, know, you could read it yeah. exactly that's where it was. You see, that's what we had to do. Right. Anyway, we we went up and we we went into this farmyard. We were we were well up, and uh, 
we were in this farmyard and my job as a brengun, as a driver, as it was, I, I drove the HQ carrier for the officer, was to jump out, get, get the brengun and take up a position so that I could look around and see there's nobody around to protect them. And my officer had said to the sergeant, uh, Walter Jones, oh, I said, we'll have a brew up. So he got the thing brewed up because we had a, a wireless operator as well in with BNHQ. And uh, we brewed, he brewed the tea up and he just, he just shouted, move. So of course I'm off like a, you know, like a shot. I could move then like. And I got the brain gun in, and I just sat down. As soon as I su- sat down on that seat, there was an explosion. And the shell hit the building, and all I could see was dirt and everything coming up, planks and bits of stuff all coming down. And when I got up, the, the officer was leaning over the front, and he had two big pieces of shrapnel in his kidneys, in his back. So I got the I was dressing in my hat, you see. I dressed him. Well, I couldn't let sit him down, so I had to lean him forward. And we got a, a cushion and put him under, and he laid on the cushion. He was laid down. Well, looking at him, I thought, well, he's a gun, because I could see he was going white, you know, grey, grey white. And I went to look for my, my sergeant, and he's swimming in a pool of blood. His, his head chopped in two, as a piece of shrapnel as big as my hand. Right back of his right ear, here, here. Cause you can't do it with dead men. So, and the thing is, the thing is about it now. When I look as an older person, it didn't affect me. I was doing the job, and you know I didn't feel sorry or anything like that. And uh, uh, as I've got older, I get right emotional. <laughs> Can't help it. And anyway, I had to take over you know, the carrier, mm-hmm. and we found out where the the, uh, the um, Red Cross bloke was, you know. And we got to him. Well, well, actually, when we came out, we came came to a little road. Well, the main road went round to the to the left of the farmhouse, but there was a cart track wanting to go onto the main road. And on that gatepost, it says uh, Jerry had put up minor, Danga Minan. Well, I didn't realise at that time, but he's put that there. So, so that was, he wanted to go on the other road, you see, to blow you up, because when, this is what we had to watch, because the lads got blown up with our landmines. Anyway, I went carefully through and I got through. And uh, I turned right and about a couple of, well, a mile and a half or so, further down. I drove in and the officer there took the carrier off me <coughs> and he took everything I had, the, the carrier, everything, uh, just as I was. He got, uh, gave it, I believe he gave us a cup of tea, if I remember, me and the wireless operator. And uh, and then we, we went to the, gun in a truck and he took us to one, th- one, one, four, three, I think it was, one, three, four, one, four, three, uh, vehicle ho- uh, holding uh, holding unit that was if anyone else wanted a wrecking man or whatever he was they could go there and go somewhere else you know we re- replace those that got knocked off <coughs> now I was extremely lucky I was always being lucky thank God <coughs> uh, when I got there uh, there was a Canadian officer in charge of us, and I've been there a couple of days, and I don't know what it was, whether I'd heard something, I don't know, but they wanted volunteers, they wanted eight volunteers. So I stepped forward along with the others. Now, obviously in army you don't volunteer, you know. <laughs> but I did, and uh, off we went, and I finished up with the... Ring me, you know, the uh, uh, armoured uh, cover. And it was a good thing with that, you know, for me, because I was supplying, I was repairing vehicles 
and then taking them up to the front, you see, and coming back again, which was all right when you were coming back. It was when you're stopping there, there was trouble, <laughs> and we could hear the guns at night. I was thank God I aren't up there, you know. But uh, that's where I was, you see, and I finished with them. And why I finished, I don't know, because. Uh, every time the notice went up, you know, report to Sean so I knew he were off, you know, back up the front. And I never went. There was only me and another bloke, and we were there all the time. So I think I must have got, took a fancy me, <laughs> to me. <laughs> uh, but I, I don't know what it was. I, I'm only assuming. Uh, well, when I got got to this unit, I, I was really due for leave. I hadn't been home for 18 months and we'd had a, a child and I hadn't seen him for 18 months. And uh, I got back from, from my, my leave and I hadn't been put on a duty. And I thought, well, you know, we all, we all know, you know, I hadn't done a duty. And I, I thought, I'll go see the officer, uh, Captain Kaufman. And I thought, what well, you say? I, th I think it was a Jewish fellow, wasn't he? That right? Anyway, uh, I went to see this chap, and, and I said, well, I said, excuse me, I said, I haven't been on a duty since I came back. So when did you come back? So and so, right, Sergeant Major, uh, HQ guard tonight, right. So we're also on guard, you see. And uh, anyway, I just got out of the door, and he called me back again. He says, cancel the last order. He says, you're on convoy duty in the morning, taking these vehicles up to the front. There again, I were lucky. <laughs> so I've been very fortunate. And uh, that's the way things go. I mean, we've had lads come to us at 11 o'clock at night and they've been wounded and back home again. Our, our hospital will be 11 o'clock next day, but it's just one of those things, you see. I'm, when I got there, I had no rifle because we were bombed every night. We took infantry work on, you see. And we were in Orchard and got bombed and uh, shrapnel. Uh, uh, well, the officer came and said, have a look at your carry, your buggy wheels blown off. And I could go and repair it. I got shrapnel through the in engine plates. And when they looked at my rifle, because I wanted a ring one, you see, it wasn't fast enough on the rifle. Uh, when they looked at it, I couldn't, I couldn't pull the bolt back, and the shrapnel had hit the breech. I couldn't pull the bolt, it was useless. But uh, that was all, all part of the carrying on day, day in and day out, you know. Like shrapnel all through, through my mess tin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just had so much to eat, and they'd just gone back again, they started bombing again. Well, they did it with the morning minis, they called them. And these bombs were on a platform, a ramp platform, the six bombs, and big ones as well. <coughs> and uh, when they went up in the air, they, they were, as, they went, as the thing went round, it sent them off. <coughs> and when they got, when they got up in there, they started, you know, like this. Well, it was a terrible sound, you know, you're, you're down. And you had about two seconds to get below ground because the, the bombs didn't penetrate the earth to that extent. It was exploding sideways. So anyone that was in when 35 yards radius of each bomb, well, so that's a big area when there's six of them down. Anyone, either their legs are off or else they had it, you know. And that's the way it was. Yeah. How old was I? Yeah. Well, I was 24 when I went in, yeah. and I was 30, well, six years, 31, wasn't I? When it came out, we had letters, special letters, that uh, so that we, the, there were, there were privileged letters that we we had. Uh, we used to get an envelope, and it was a sort of private. It hadn't to write anything military about it, you know, but they could be opened by the officers if they suspected anything. But because you you didn't do that, and uh, that's we wrote just normal, but. <laughs> We didn't always get them regular, you know. <laughs> we got them when we could. I'll tell you the truth. I didn't know that they were treating the the, the Jews like they were. I had no idea. And I was in, I, I was all, all all through the war until I got to uh, when we in, when we got into Germany uh, in a little village called Brockham, 
the other side of Osnabrück. And uh, the officer there, because the, the, the fighting had finished at that time, and the officer there got... There was only women and children and old men. There were no young men. In fact, the farm where what we took over, uh, the, the girl there, Elsa, they called her, had five brothers all killed in Russia. And the, I always remember the old man saying, Creek ni good. You know, he was a farmer. Well, <laughs> I knew that, you know. And uh, Creek mean war, you know, war no good. And uh, uh, the officers took all the, the women and made them march through with their... Well, they took a big house, made it their office, made them march through and look at all the big posters on the wall and there were Auschwitz and Belsen, all the... That you've all seen, you know, all these photos of the atrocities that they, they committed. And they came out of there, and honestly, I don't think they knew. They were all, every one of them were weeping. It, I just took it part of life, you know. It, it just happened, you know. I mean, uh, I had no control of what they did to me because I was under conscription and... I I was like everything else. I, I grew up as a young man chasing the girls like you did, and you know, and all that sort of stuff. And then eventually, I, I married, and then I went off to war. So it wasn't a very long long honeymoon, you know. <laughs> but there were thousands like me. I'm not complaining because they were all everybody in the same. Or the war changed everybody's life, even to little children. I mean, little children were taken from cities into the country and they weren't always made happy in some of the houses they went to. You know, there's, there's lots of tales about them being in, ill-treated and things like that. So there's a lot of uh, stories about that. That's the 1939-45 star. Uh, that one's a France-Germany medal. That's... The, the war medal, and that's the uh, 39 40 medal. And what, what did you get these medals for? Well, just for being there. <laughs> I wasn't a John Wayne, shall we say, you know. I mean, he got some plastic bullets, but I <laughs> I wasn't one of them. <laughs> but uh, I, I just did a job. I was given to do a job, and I, I did the best I could. I was like so many others, you know, we're all... All took a chance, and a uh, lot of situations wasn't very pleasant. Infantry is usually engaged with a rifle and uh, doing as you're told. Well, that's uh, looking out for the enemy and engaging them, that's all. You know, they're just ordinary soldiers. They're there to kill the enemy. I was involved only a short time. I mean, I was trained as infantry in the beginning, but they changed it because actually reconnaissance was really originated by the Germans when they came on with motorbikes and sidecars when the Maginot Line was around. And they came reconnoitring where it was. And so obviously they couldn't go there, so they went round. So, but that's what reconnaissance is. It's, it's spying, actually. But... Uh, we did infantry work, but when we went over in the first in the first lot, uh, when we landed in Normandy, uh, we we had the uh, Brengun carries were all uh, boarded well, that sheets of metal up, uh, waterproof, so that if we were in deep water, at least it would float or so. And we tried to do, we did it, and it was try, we tried it was a success. But as soon as we got there, there were no... We were only about 18 inches of water, you know, so I didn't need them. So we we went up, we got away, and we took them all off, you see, and then we regrouped, then listening for uh, further orders. The, ne the next orders were we had to go to a certain position. I don't know where it was, because it was, in, it was a farmhouse, actually. But uh, I remember going entering this place <coughs> and the, well the officer asked for volunteers for take the ammunition up and motor bombs and all the rest of the stuff in my carrier and I, I went up and I always remember 
everything seemed everything seemed still. There were no no sounds or anything. It was a, a funny feeling, you know, everything seemed so quiet. And there's my engine going where well, you could hear it for miles. Well, when I got to the out of this field, I had to turn right. And the farmhouse was on the left hand side. Well I turned right. Well, with a carrier you have to rev up to go round. It brake, you see, on one side and the other's driving. So you have to rev up to get that going, otherwise you'd stall it. And I did this, well you could hear it for miles, this engine going, and of course the jury would obviously it was only, it was only about hundred yards away. And uh I must have heard it. And been well, the officer jumped out of his car. I said, oh, he says, I'm just going to negotiate with the infantry blokes. So I take cover car, I said, right, oh, and I jumped into a ditch. So I thought, thank God it was deep. And I went, laid there. And he says, when they come up, he says, just tell them to take cover. That's my mate, you see, because they were doing infantry work this, that time. And uh, I'd only just got down and they started mortar bombing. Good Lord, you know, talk about stomach. <laughs> uh, it was an experience, you see. It was, because you get used to it. Like, well, you get used to it up to a point. You know what's coming, you see. And uh, there were bombs dropping all over the place. And there were all these edge bottoms and all bits dropping off on top of me. But, of course, I was well down in this ditch. It was all right, unless it went in like. And then these lads come up as white as sheets after the bombing had stopped. And they took cover until we went into this orchard. And there in the orchard we we got into what we call foxholes. There were two fellas in the in the trench, you see. And I was on the right hand flank with a, a corporal a corporal barrows and with him. And as I say, when I got the meal this day and I'd only just had the meal and I put the I just put the mesh in at the top of the uh, ground there and then bombed it. When I picked it up I just shot and threw it. <laughs> but that's only one thing you see. And then I got moved to a forward position and when I looked out I could see uh, well they call them chateaus, you know, a big a very big house and it was a beautiful house, it really was, because we were perched not on top of a hill but on a rise. It wasn't a hill, you know, just a bit of a rise. And I could just see down. And uh, there was a, a, a sort of a round tower at the end of this building with a cone roof. And uh, this particular evening, I, wa I was on my own. I wasn't with anyone else. And I, I saw two pinpoints of light. I'm automatically, you, you learn very quick, you know, down instantly, and of course, it, oh, a machine gun, me, see, and it was hitting the edges above, and stuff was dropping off and hitting the ground. And I thought, well, I'll give him a time, because I thought, now, he'd be, same, if it was me firing at him, I'd be looking to see if I'd done anything. So I let him do the same, and while he was looking up, I let him have it. He didn't fire again. I don't know what happened, I didn't go to look. But that was that. Now, the thing was, we had, I don't know if I should mention names, but there was a major. Uh, personally, I didn't think much of him, but, that's by the way, he came up to me and says, oh, of course, he says, uh, do you realise you gave your position away last night? I don't know where he'd been. We'd been bumped for a four, four or five days. <laughs> you know, he was almost two miles back with this bloke, but by the way. Uh, and there was other things besides, but uh, anyway, they got over that. And then I noticed I was certain there was someone in that top of that tower. And I, I could see, I don't know if it was a, a reflection of a glass or something, it just caught my eye. I'm certain there's somebody there, because higher up you are, the more you can see, you see, until you don't want a high point. And... Uh, these are the things that you learn quickly as you go along, you know. Field craft, they call it. And uh, my office came up, said, anything to report? I said, yes, I think there's a, I'm certain there's a bloke up there. I said, right, and I shifted him. Well, I went back, and about 
about half an hour late, I think, about six shells come over. You can hear, you, when you hear a shell, you're all right. It's when you can't hear them that it's trouble. They're going to, whoosh, 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 like this, going over, and it blew the top of the thing off. And we never got bombed no more. So they, obviously the, the bloke there was directing the fire, you see. <coughs> but uh, that's all part of the little... <laughs> All in a day's work, shall we say. <laughs> when we went through villages, we went through some villages that were on fire. Some of the houses were on fire. Uh, other places, they came out uh, greeting us, a lot of the uh, men and women, with this calvados, I think they called it. It was terrible stuff. <laughs> and uh, they were very pleased to see us. We could not, didn't understand the language, but they were all, you know, women coming and giving you a kiss and all that sort of stuff. But, I mean, that was all right up to a point, but, I mean, we were, we were watching out for Jerry because the, the very, the, the very, very clever soldiers, these Germans, have been well-trained and they, they knew the business. Uh, but uh, we did get a lot of help with the um, Mackey, the French resistance. Uh, they used to sometimes would be going towards a, a village. We never went through the towns. Uh, that was... You know, we were only for reconnaissance, not fighting. And we were going, and the jury, I remember one of them, he got out of Edge Bottom. Oh, I, I don't know if he was a German, only a little fella like me. And they're <laughs> not supposed to be guns, you know. But uh, he was a black as ink, hadn't been a shave, he hadn't had a shave for days, and he, he stunk. And uh, he had a, some black bread, I think they call it, half of a loaf under his arm. And he was holding it like this, it came out, because we disarmed him, any knives or guns up, took everything off. And we got this bread, and it smelled, and it was green mouldy. And we threw it over its wall, and he was shouting, Mungi, Mungi, you know, food, food. <laughs> but uh, we don't, don't take prisoners, we send them back, you know, we have no time for it, all like that. And uh, But the, the Mackie as well, they gave us information, if there was... And the juries, you know, in the village, or had they gone, had they withdrawn, things like that, we could send back, and that was that was our job, you know, just uh, information. Not not a very healthy job, really. <laughs> <laughs> I came out of the army, went to Brayshaws, and after about eighteen months, I I decided I'd start on my own. I had six pound five shillings. And that was my capital. I had nothing in the bank because what I got out of the army didn't buy me a, a second-hand bedroom, a bedroom, no, wardrobe and one bed with no mattress. And that was for six years. That's all I got. Never mind. Uh, uh, my wife worked at the aircraft factory at, uh, uh, up at Yeadon. And <coughs> anyway... I started on my own, and I worked at Horsforth. Uh, Mrs. Gledhill, she lived, she lived on All Lane at a big house, and I used to go on a night, on weekends, working apart from Brayshaws, earning a few coppers, you know. And then I started, and I finished the job. Uh, I finished the job there, and they got paid, thank God. And then I found other work, and it, it was a struggle because I had no money, I had no backing. You know, it was just it was really hard going. I had a bicycle and a, and, a, and a box, and this is how I used to go, you know, 10 o'clock at night coming home work. But it was hard going. But uh, the thing was, uh, in my work, I met so many different characters. And it was very, very interesting to me, not, you know, meeting different people in all walks of life. I'm not just talking about uh, Tom, uh, Tom Jones up street. I'm talking about millionaires that I've worked for, you know. My father worked for Lord Airwood, French polishing. So I wanted, <coughs> wanted about trade, my mother. Yeah. And, uh, of course, I learnt my trade from him. But I worked for Harry Ramsden's showman as, as well, you know. I worked for a brace yard. 
And uh, he said, oh, I said, I want you to go to Harry Ramsden. He said he wants a job doing. And when I got there, it's his original wooden hut. And it was on television last night, actually. <coughs> now, when I got there, a typical Yorkshire fella, which I'm used to. Now they're like, can you do a job? So, yes. I said, what is it? He said, all this panelling around it up to the day door, it was mahogany, you know, plywood. It had faded over the years. It wanted stripping and repolishing. Can you do a job? I said, I can do a job. Right. <coughs> he had the desk. Now then, he said, in this drawer, he says, in this drawer are bills that's been paid. And he opened it, nothing. Shoved it. And in this drawer, there's bills, bills that's got to be paid. No, that was uh, paid that were full. When this drawer, these are bills that's got to be paid. There were nothing, you know. So that was his humour. Now, on the wall, I looked on the wall, there were two pictures, and one of them had a bit of poetry in. And one said, one was, uh, Harry stood at the pearly gates, his face was worn and old. He meekly asked the man of fate admission for the fold. What have you done, St Peter said, to seek admission here? I, ca I kept a geysley fish shop for money and money a year. The gate flew open widely as Peter pressed the bell. Come in, old man, there's a, and take a harp, there's had enough of hell. And that was one of them. <laughs> and on the other one, it was a cheque for three guineas from the BBC. And underneath it, he had it written, in case of emergency, break the glass. <laughs> but that was his humour, you see. 